the Archaeological Society Malta and the Department of Classics and Archaeology are delighted to welcome you to this, uh, sadly the last in our uh, series of talks for 2020-2021. Uh, um, as usual, uh, I'd like to welcome any art, uh, international um, participants, and I can see a few of those, and uh, uh, also to welcome, particularly, um, I know that we have members of the family of <coughs> uh, Francis uh, Malia, and of course we are really very pleased to have you with us this evening. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Patricia Camilleri, President of the Archaeological Society Malta, and I shall be mediating this evening's session. Uh, I'd like to make sure that um, you mute yourselves, as I was saying before, so that we don't have any echo issues, and, uh, I, uh, and I'd like to, again, inform everybody that uh, this uh, talk is being recorded. The use of your own video uh, is of course um, totally optional. Uh, all these season's lectures were a collaboration between the Department of Classics and Archaeology, University of Malta, and the Archaeological Society Malta. Thanks, oh, as always, go to the head of department, Dr. John C. Betts, who is with us this evening, and to Professor Nicholas Vella, also here this evening, ASM Vice President, uh, who is the link uh, between us, the society, and, and the department. Uh, just a word, just to say how we shall proceed. Um, it's become quite usual now, but uh, perhaps other people have not been with us so far. Uh, I'll be introducing our guest speaker, Nico Muscat, then turning the virtual floor over to him. Um, please do ask your questions uh, using the chat which you can uh, access uh, either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Uh, please do so anytime during the talk. And I shall be uh, asking um, Nico to answer some of those, at least some of those questions uh, at the end as time, as time allows. This evening's lecture is entitled The Contribution of Francis S. Malia, 1921, 1988, to Maltese archaeology and archaeological practice. So let's move on. A quick and modest word about our guest speaker. Mr. Muscat is an archaeology honours graduate with a master's degree in archaeology. And uh, I'd like to uh, add uh, to that by saying that Nico is one of our young generation of archaeologists who will doubtless carry the flag uh, for future archaeology in, in Malta. He's a member of the ASM committee and we're very glad to have him uh, with us. Uh, so without further ado, Nico, um, over to you. Um, I'm going to share the screen for you. And there we are, co-hosts. Okay, you. you can share your screen, Nico. So here we go, everyone should have access to the screen now. Thank you everyone for attending. And this is the my presentation, the contribution of Francis S. Malia, 1921-1988 to Maltese archaeology and archaeological practice. The reason I chose this particular image to start off was that Francis Malia had different roles during his career, but I felt that he was the happiest when he was being the curator of archaeology and excavating. So I thought it was fitting to start off with this particular image. We'll be discussing seven points today. First, we'll be introducing briefly who Francis Maria was. Then we'll look at the discipline of history of archaeology. We'll then look at the approach which was used, the biographical historical approach. We'll then look at the, the data or some of the data that I looked at, which is mainly the Francis Mali archive and some other sources. Then we'll look at six key moments from Francis Malia 
through the years. And because it's impossible to cater to many moments, I decided to pick six particular moments for, for the discussion. And then we'll pick some themes which emerge from these particular moments and further up on them as well. And then we'll conclude by looking back from the biographical historical approach to the themes that are apparent in the moments. So who was Francis S. Malia? He was born in Burgu in 1921. He worked as an army clerk during World War II. So at the age of 19, he had to stop his initial work and join the army and join the war effort. In 1945, he started working as a draftsman in the water and the electricity department with the civil government. And as I will explain further on later, I believe that these were his formative years, the years that he worked as a draftsman. He became curator of archaeology in 1959 and then became director of the museum's department in 1971 for 10 years. He retired in 1981 with a lot of plans to focus on research, to focus on voluntary organizations, and get back into the field, and that he managed to do some of that before he said he passed away in 1988. So, history of archaeology as a discipline. Most of us who at least know the basis of archaeology know that archaeology is traditionally the recovery and analysis of material culture, so excavating or studying a particular period or culture or society and by excavating the material itself to learning more about the society. Here we're looking at a shift and the archaeologists began looking inwards and studying the people behind the discipline, their themselves and also their predecessors. And it's this idea of critical self-consciousness by archaeologists, and it was first proposed by David Clark in his work, Archaeology, the Loss of Innocence, where he push forward the idea that now archaeologists were becoming conscious of their own work, but also critical of some things they may have done wrong themselves or other actions which may have prohibited or pushed forward the idea and the discipline of archaeology. Ian Hodder then and the rest of the post processualists said that the past can only exist in relation to social, political and economic contexts. So as any particular site, any particular artifact needs to be studied in a context to understand what was happening. Here as well, you need to look at social, political, and economic context to understand the person himself. We must keep in mind that no one person operates in a vacuum and there are always reasons for certain actions which are undertaken. Even though history of archaeology is a discipline, it means that it's a broad concept and that means there are different approaches that one can take when studying history of archaeology. And the initial approach, and one of the most common in the beginning, was that you study one person in detail and through a biography, you list a set of achievements that that person had, had done in their career. So it's a narrative of building a list of achievements in a sort of a heroic tale that this person did so many great things in his life and you're showcasing and telling others what that person did. So you're shifting from material culture, analyzing material culture to a story of personalities. But this is not the only approach that is possible for history of archeology span and when you look at the historical biographical approach, which was also the approach I used in my study, Mark Antoine Kaiser, who's one of the main proponents of using the biographical historical approach in history of archaeology, says that biographies are keys. So you're studying that particular person, but they're not the end of the study, but they're the start. So in my case, I studied Francis Malia, but the information I got from Francis Malia and the themes that emerged, then I could use them to study and understand better the period 
itself. So the biographical historical approach, as we've said already, you're moving from understanding and analyzing a broad issue to considering one individual and understanding the social, political, and economical context that they lived in. So it's a more in-depth look at one person at first, and then you're expanding outwards once you learn more information. So you have this idea of going from a micro to a macro level. So you're going to first study the particular person, in this case, Francis Malia, and then you're moving forward to understand the period itself. This is a shift from the previous approach that I mentioned that the history, the history of archaeologists use because they no longer aim to praise, but will criticize if necessary. If there was something that was done that should not have been done or that it could have been not done better, they will say so. They will look, and I've looked at the scientific progress in the discipline rather than present it as part of a heroic thing. With that said, it's easy to fall into this trap. So it's something that I had to keep in mind constantly because after looking at the, the material, being introduced to the family and forming an emotional link with the person you're studying for, for that long, it's easy to start looking at only the positives of that person. So you need to be conscious yourself that you need to be critical and give both the pros and cons of the particular person. And as I said already, these are histories which adopt a contextual approach. So Francis Malia was studied with economical, political, and social conditions of Malta at the time as well. So there are three main categories of sources which are helpful and beneficial when it comes to this kind of study. The first is material sources. It's one of the most diverse pool of resources, and it can include anything from publications, articles, comments by others. And this gives you more a sense of the public persona of a person, because you're getting people commenting, reviewing their works. So you're getting a sense of how that work was received by the person. The only exception to this case is if that person wrote an autobiography, but we also need to keep in mind that even though they're letting us in into more intimate thoughts, these thoughts are still the ones that they wanted us to see. So it's not how their character works when they're in their own archive or in their own study or at an excavation, but what they want to present to the public. Another source which is very important if a person is lucky enough to get that opportunity it's the oral sources and if you're lucky enough to interview and talk to people who lived in the same period and knew this particular person you can get a much better sense of who that person was as a character now rather than just the material itself and i was lucky to get this opportunity and we'll talk about that also later on Private papers, the private archive was one which I was the source which I used the most probably, and it gets you to know more about the thoughts of the person and how they approach their line of work. Most times when one person is writing their own work on their own publications, their own excavations, they're writing their own notes, their own, they have their own thought process, and this is not something which most people will share with the public. So you get a more intimate sense of who that person is. And now we can shift to the Francis S. Mali archive. The archive, as it stands now, consists of 18 boxes, and it amounts to 1,034 different individually numbered items and includes notebooks, handwritten notes, photos, correspondence, maps, and other items. There are items, for example, so one item is a box file. So if one had to look at the loose items, they would amount to much more than 1,034. I've picked this picture to start off with because it gives you a sense of some of the material that was received by the department and the start of the process. I think the amount of material present also gives you an indication of the character of Francis Malia, and we'll go more into this, that he was 
technical and he wanted to report things. So if he needed to prove something there, then he also had something written down to show. One thing to keep in mind is that even before I talked to some of the family members, I had the sense that Francis Malia was leaving his archive, his work for someone to see. In the sense that he had folders written down with one particular project, for example, and then he had indications of what one could find in this article or in this file. So I got the sense that he was leaving his archive for others to see after him. The material remained in place for a number of years, even after he passed away, and then it was only moved after his wife passed away as well. And that was one of the main initial challenges to make sure that the items that I was looking at, and since there were a lot of loose notes, for example, I needed to make sure that they correspond with each other. And because I was building a narrative, I needed to make sure it was the correct narrative. Because if I'm looking at different notes, which are not in order, that would obviously paint a false narrative. And that is not something which you wanted. But the best way to understand what there is in the archive is to go through some, some examples. And that's what we'll be doing now. So for example, here we've got a section of a silo in Mtarpa. And already you can get a sense of the detail and technical knowledge that Francis Malia had in his work. This is one of many, and these are found in notebooks even with David Trump. This is another example. It's of a Punic tomb in Msida. And here you can see more detail. He's giving notes. He is giving precise details of what was found and different layers that were found. And also the, the images and the, the location of the street. And these are things that he often gave to give them more complete idea of what was happening. This is a measurement of a juvenile jar burial in 1968 from Talvirv II. And this also shows you that the curator of archaeology at the time was the person who was excavating, but he was also the person who was analyzing the material. So in this case, he did the drawing and the measurement. And again, it's the process of being technical, and this is something which he enjoyed. In this case, as I mentioned already, the need and the quantity of loose notes. And here is just one example of the many loose notes that were found in the archive. And they gave an, an, an idea of what he wanted to do that week, who he wanted to talk to, research he wanted to move forward with. And these often followed and processed like a, a diary, for example, mentioning each day what he needed to do. So getting a sense and realizing what he meant in these loose notes was very important to build a correct narrative. Some photos now, and here I picked three in particular. Photos are again a source which are very abundant in the archive. So in two of these examples, we're seeing Malia as director who's showing other distinguished guests around the museums that were open in his time as director. And in the other case, we're seeing Francis Malia and the minister Agatha Barbara, and he's showing her the site. Now, some of you may realize, me may, may re see that site and see that it's the Zaytun Roman villa. And obviously, one can note that it's a completely different process than what we're accustomed to today. Correspondence was also something which was very commonly found in the archive. And in this case, it's a letter sent by the minister Agatha Barbara to Francis Malia, asking him to find a set of cannons for St. John's Cavalier. And when he became director, this was something which was very common that this correspondence was almost being sent daily. Some more pictures in this case, there are images from the excavation of the Tal Virtu in Rabat in 1968. And as you can see, he is using the proper photographic principles to take proper archaeological photos. 
These slides are quite interesting because they're hand drawn by Francis Malia. And again, this shows you a different element to his work. Francis Malia's curator had to work on sites, excavate sites, analyze the material, but he also needed to take care of the exhibits in the museum. So in this case, he was preparing temporary exhibits to showcase in the museum. So for example, you have prehistory, you have the Middle Ages, and along with these images, with these drawings, you had a list of material that you wanted to present. When I was working on the material, it was also important to be creating a database for the archive. And this was done for a number of reasons. It was done to make sure that the system was organized, but also if other researchers or students want to look at the archive in the future, they can get the ability to do so. And as I mentioned already, it has the number and collection. It has the type of document, for example, if it has a particular name, if it has other notes, if it has links between one document and the next. And I also use the system of keywords and there was a maximum of four keywords from a maximum of 20, where it could give a better indication of that person and that particular document in question. As I said, the Francis S. Mali archive was one of the main sources that I use, but it wasn't the only source which I used. And one source which was very important was the interviews that were done with the people close to Malia. Personally, I made sure that even with the closure of time that you, I looked at three family members and three were colleagues, so they could give me different perspectives of Malia and how they integrated and how, what their relationship was with him. So in the case of the family members, I interviewed Albert Malia, who was the eldest son and the eldest of the children, Monica Capello, who's here today, and Joe Capello, who's here today as well. And when it comes to the work colleagues, I talked to Father Miles Zerafo, who worked with Francis Malia the most. He met Malia when Malia was already curator. And then also, even when he was director, Francis Malia, Father Mario Zerafa was the curator of fine arts. And when Francis Malia retired from the department, he gave a recommendation for Father Zerafa to be the next director after him. I also interviewed Professor Mario Bohaja, who met Malia as who was already established as curator. And he was the one who taught him how to excavate and also introduced him in a, the proper way of the museum's department. So he was a sort of a mentor figure when he introduced him to the museum's department. And I also interviewed Professor Henry Bonanno, who met Francis Malia a bit later on in his career. And this was a different relationship as they worked together on particular projects. So it was important for me to look at different perspectives and get an understanding of Malia, the character now, rather than Malia just on what he worked on. The last source that I will be mentioning today is the workings of the museum department. So the museum and the reports. And these were important because I could see what Malia was presenting to the public. In the archive, I could see different drafts of these reports, and I could see what Malia deemed to be important to show to the public, or maybe things that the department needed to work more on, and maybe they would appear in the following year. So it's important, it was important to see this idea of public and private. And also the correspondence found at the National Museum of Archaeology, because they gave a more formal sense of the correspondence. So the correspondence found at the National Museum of Archaeology was done when Malia was curator and director, and the ones found in the archive are more personal, even if they may be the same individuals, they're more on friendly terms because they're not strictly museum business. Now that we've looked at the sources, we'll be going through some key moments of Francis Malia's career. And these three images already give us an indication of Malia through the years. So Malia as a young man, Malia during his curator years, and Malia as director. Although we won't be going to it 
today, I think it's important to mention, as I said already, the idea of the context and the Malta that we're talking about here and the Malta that Francis Malia lived in was a Malta which was undergoing a transformation. It was a Malta which was finding, it, finding its own identity and the Malta that was after a long period of part of the British Empire, it was gaining its own political status. So independence, republic, a free nation. And it was also normal for other countries to try and gain influence. We also need to keep in mind that there were two political parties, the Labour Party and the Nationalist Party, which were alternating in power during this period. And with every alternation in government, they were bringing with them different and in some cases very different ideological views. And so this is the context that Malia was working in and even talking to the different individuals who were in charge of the museum's department. So first off, we'll start off with the period of him becoming curator. The formal teaching that Francis Malia got when he was young was in architecture at the Royal University of Malta, but this already gives you a sense of the detail, as I said, the precise details, the precise drawings were already shown here. In 1945, after becoming good, after he was a part of the army, he joined the Water and Electricity Department. And I said these were his formative years because he received training in surveying, map making, photography, and also gained an interest in geology. So even though he was learning and being taught things to work on as a draftsman, these would serve him very well when he became curator. And even though he would be taught other things later on, these are the things that felt more most natural to him. And this could be seen in the drawings and the plans and the sections that one can find in the archive. He was also the co-founder of the Vittoriosa Historical and Cultural Society and also its first secretary. This won't be an element we'll go into it too much today, but in the 1950s, after the World War, Vittoriosa and the whole of the Cotton era, area was one of the areas that was have mostly heavily hit by the war. And so while the authorities were trying to rebuild, they were looking more at getting people back in and trying to get the cities to thrive again. So the buildings themselves may not have been given as much importance as they should have been. And so it fell upon the Vittoriosa Historical and Cultural Society to make sure that certain sites, certain buildings, certain attractions were not lost in this period. From 1957 onwards, he was also appointed by the government as a member of the Antiquities Committee. So you can start seeing that he was slowly involving himself in the field of the cultural heritage field. But if one needs to look at the very initial start of when he, the journey of him becoming curator started, it was in 1955, when Captain Charles Zombie, who was the then curator of archaeology, became director of the museum's department. Captain Charles Zombie, who was the son of Sir Tim Zombie, had spent 21 years as curator of archaeology. And when he became director, crucially, the role of curator remained vacant and no Call, official call was made for this post to be fulfilled. But this did not detract Mali at all, because a few days after he sent this first application to Agatha Barbara, highlighting the main areas he worked on, including his skills in photography, his interest in geology, for example, and also his involvement in the Vittoriosa Cultural Society. So even at this very early stage, he's showing a keen interest in becoming curator. And even though this application was not accepted because there was no official call, you can already get a sense of what was to come. The first official call was made in 1956. And here you can see the second application. And even if it's just a year has passed from the first one, you can already see that it's even more detailed. So he inserted and made sure that there were testimonials, certificates, and other things to show his work. 
So in a year, you're also seeing that he's continuing to work in, upon himself to make sure he is more serious and the ideal candidate to become curator. One can look at this period, the 1955-1959, until he, until he became curator, and one could say that it may be a bit of a lost period, but in reality, he was immersing himself in this field of archaeology, attending lectures, going to particular courses, learning to excavate. So these four years were his true formation of immersing himself in this field. And this idea of making key connections, one of the key connections that he made was with John Davis Evans, who would later become a professor in the Institute of Archaeology in London. And in John Evans, Malia found a mentor, he found a friend, and a person who he could discuss and ask for advice as well. And this relationship was so strong that when John Evans needed help, for his work, for the survey of Mota, he asked Francis Malia to do sections in the prehistoric temples. So it was clear that there was trust and a good friendship forming in, between the two. In 1957, there was a change of approach by the government who stated that they would train and appoint a foreign archeologist and then he would train a successor. And this was also an admittance that the people who had applied, including Francis Malia, did not have enough training in archaeology to become curator. The choice would be whether it was an Italian or a British would be chosen. And this was mostly based on political motivations. Even though the British, the Labour Party was closely tied to having pro-British roots and was normally seen as being pro-British in this period, since integration with Britain had failed, they were looking more at Italy. So there was more hope from the government that an Italian archaeologist would follow and become curator. But that would mean that he would be trained in the method of the Italian spit method rather than the British stratigraphic method. When in April 1958, the Maltese lost self-government and the decisions were taken again by the British, they moved and chose, and chose David Trump as curator. And he was appointed as curator in 1958 on a contract of three years, which could be extended to another further two years. The official call for the post of curator then was opened in 1959. And as you can see, they made it clear that they want a candidate who was from the age of 25 to 45, and that he also had the particular skills and qualifications to study for a postgraduate diploma in the Institute of Archaeology. Malia, once again, did an application and he was the person chosen to become curator. The years 1960-1963 were crucial for Malia's future career, because he learned proper archaeological techniques and methods which he used throughout the rest of his career. And his work and his studies happened on two fronts, learning gained from practical experiences and also formal education at the Institute of Archaeology. David Trump acted as a mentor to Maria. He taught him different techniques from the stratigraphic method of excavation, and they had the opportunity to practice what they what Trump was teaching as. Malia joined Trump on all the sites that were being found and discovered in Mota at the time. So he got the peer, he got the time and the experience to excavate the proper way. But also at the same time, he was also being taught other things. So for example, how to set up a museum and together they set up the Gozo Museum in 1960. So he was being taught different ideas and different concepts that would teach him the practical area of archaeology. In the formal method, then there was the Institute of Archaeology, where he spent two years there. And here you can see the first letter which he received, that he was accepted as an internal student in the Institute, and then also the diploma that he received at the end of the, at the, end of the academic study. 
this study took a bit longer than that was expected, but this was something which was only normal. And one also needs to keep in mind that this was not an easy period for all who were involved. After all, Malia, at the age of 39, had to leave behind his family, his wife, and his four children, who were quite young, behind to study. So this was a period which was challenging for everyone involved. After he graduated and he got the diploma in 1963, from 1964 onwards, he was to become the sole curator of archaeology. And one of the first and biggest sites he would be involved in was Armour Doom. And Armour Doom was discovered in 1964, in November 1964, by a team of cave explorers from the first Lima Scout Group. And it was led by Paul Calayagera and consisted of five others. Francis Malia was informed a few days later and was to help the team as much as he could. But now we need to keep in mind that since he was the sole curator of archaeology, he could not be at one particular site all the time. So he made sure that he taught the team how to collect the material, but his own work related to site would be more on post-excavation and analysis of the discovered artifacts. I showed this drawing by Paul Caldea Gera, so you get a sense of Armour Doom and how big the site was in itself, and one would wonder if an excavation of such site would happen today, how long it would take, and the process of using the stratigraphic method in this approach. Francis Malia was not known to give a lot of lectures, but he gave one on our Armour Doom in 1965. And he explained some of the finds found on site, mainly the pottery, but he also focused on three key pieces, including a small bronze dagger with the handle made out of bone. He made sketches of the handle and the dagger, and we'll see those, and they were published in the Times of Malta. And when one looks at the conclusions that were made by Francis Malia and David Tanaji, who looked and studied the material, from 2007 to 2010, you can see that most conclusions were similar, and mostly when it came to the link between Malta and Sicily and the pottery involved. And the difference would be that Malia arrived to these conclusions from the pottery, and David Tanazi could look at all the different material culture that was present. But something which David Tanazi states, and also Francis Malia himself, had stated was that this was not a proper systematic excavation. And Francis Malia made it clear to Paul Caleagera that they were collecting the material, but not excavating. And we need to keep in mind that he was the only person in the museum's department was trained in the stratigraphic method. Even though Charles Zamit had some training, he was now director, but he was also never formally trained in this method. And so this would also be a point of anger for Malia because he tried to do his best on all sides. But since he was only one person, and at this time there was a lot of discoveries being made, he had to leave the work up to other people who meant well. But since they were not trained, mistakes were being made and information could be lost. Here you can see the sketches and drawings that Malia himself did and appeared at times of Malta. And these are the bone dagger handle and the dagger itself. When one looks at the links between the Italian and the British methods of excavation and the clashes between them, there is no better example than the Missione Archeologica Italiana in Malta, 1963-1970. Now this mission has already been studied by a number of people and who looked at the pro-British and pro-Italian side. But here I will go briefly on the Maltese side, mainly Malia. As we've said already, he was a true believer in the stratigraphic method, but he was concerned that neither Francis Malia himself or David Trump were involved in the decision for the mission to come to Malta. Francis Malia himself was involved in 1964 and 1965, and he looked and analyzed the pottery that were discovered during those seasons. In 1967, when talking to Michael Ridley, who was also interested in excavating the Tassel site, 
he expressed his view that this excavation should have never taken place. And his main reason being that they were not using the British stratigraphic method and they were using the Delhi method. And he was also concerned because they were also using heavy machinery. So he was worried that material was being destroyed before the proper individuals could get a time, could get a chance to study them. And this led to Malia having discussions with the Italian director Moscati, and he believed that it would be best for him to step back from this mission so he could stay true to his principles. So here we see a case of the political implications being more important than the archaeology itself, because there was a link between the Italian government and the government of Morda, who, as we know, at the time, the Nationalist Party had a close link with the Italian government. And so the political implications were more important than the archaeology itself. But since I've mentioned this idea of stratigraphic method quite a number of times already, it's natural for you to wonder whether Malia had the opportunity and indeed practice what he preached by using this stratigraphic method to excavate the proper way. And I would be lying to you if I said that Malia mirrored exactly an excavation which happens today using the stratigraphic method of excavation. But the 1970s Ayatou excavation shows that when he had time and was present on site, Malia's excavations followed the stratigraphic method closely. The Ayatou site in Rabat was a larger excavation and it followed another site, another excavation, the Aya one, which started in 1965, and this one focused on the uncovering of architectural remains of the city fortifications. And in this particular example, he more than usual kept a detailed account of proceedings, including a list of trenches and trench plan. There is only one other example which we won't go into today, which had the same level of detail, and that was the Tarrat DNA excavation in 1986 when he was retired. Here you can get a sense of the plans that Malia used in this Ayatou excavation. So you can see the areas that were that were excavated, the trenches, and you can also look at the detail that Malia was making sure was present on these plans. And such plan could be in place in an excavation today. So there is such detail in this example that he's looking at the different areas and trenches. Again, here he's also noting the measurements of each trench and also some information that were found about the layers themselves. The same thing follows, so different areas, giving some notes about the areas and also an indication where they were on site. For the first time in the archive for this particular example, I found a notebook, a rough version of a notebook, which contained detailed notes on each different layer of soil and the long notes on each individual trench and bulk. Important finds were also listed with each layer they were uncovered in, and he also gave exact measurements for the artifact. Mali also notes that detailed photographs were also taken including for all sides of the trenches and also photographs using scales when it was needed for individual items. So here we're seeing the level of detail that he could apply when he had time. And here we have just an idea of the notebook that he used where he's marking the date, he's marking the particular trenches, the layer, and also some remarks. And this is a unique example that was found in his archive since in other excavations, including rescue excavations, they wouldn't have the time to focus in such detail. We've talked already about Malia in the curator phase, and so now we'll focus in the last two key moments on Malia as director. When we've talked already about him becoming curator, there were implications and political influences from Italy and Britain. In this case, there were also political influence, but also at a local level. And it was known that Charles Zammit in 1971 would retire, and Francis Malia was the apparent successor of Charles Zammit to become director. 
there was only one other candidate who could become director at the time, and that was John Kauke. John Kauke was the curator of fine arts and who was the longest serving member of the museum's department. With that said, John Kauke was only a year younger than Charles Rami, so he could not offer a long-term vision of that Malia could provide. Since Malia was only age 50 at the time, he could at least provide a 10-year vision to the department. And one needs to keep in mind that Malia really wanted to become director at this time. And although that would be something his impression would change later on when he had to work on more administrative side of the road. The biggest challenge in him becoming director did indeed come from outside the department. And it was an individual from the public works division who had an interest in becoming director and also had links with the Maltese government and also the British governor at the time. Here in this set of notes, even though they may look as a jumbled set of notes, Malia in September 1970 was already preparing what he should do, who he should talk to, to focus on becoming director. So it was something that he wanted and a number of these notes were present on who he should talk to and noting down what was happening at the time. But this idea of a foreign influence of outside the department was something that worried even the General Workers Union because they sent a letter to the minister and this is part of the letter that they sent that they emphasized that a member, a curator from the department should become director because this was always what happened in the past and they should follow the procedure that was that had happened. So here we're seeing another influence that was pushing forward the idea that a curator from the department should become director. And realistically, it was only Malia who could become the director. This pressure worked because Malia in 1971 became the director of the museum's department. So for our last key moment for today, we'll be looking at the expansion of the museum's department. And we need to keep in mind that as one of the leading figures of the civil service, Malia played a leading role along with the minister Agatha Barbara to form Mata's culture heritage policy. So his voice was out there and that's why there was a constant communication with the minister. The culture sector at this time, so the importance of context, became much more important to the government because Malta now as an independent nation needed to find its own economic sectors which would push forward Malta and so culture sector and tourism in this culture heritage sense made this sector much more important to the government so that meant that instead of having one central museum and that was the case from 1922 when the museum's department started now we had specialized museums being opened across Malta and during Malia's time as director, three museums were opened, and then another one was also planned. So the first museum to be opened was the National History Museum. It was opened in 1973, and it was opened at the Villena Palace, where it still resides today. Initial plans were started in 1963, but it was then opened in 1973. And in the images here, you can see both Francis Malia and Agatha Barbara giving a speech and highlighting and indicating how the government and also the department pushed forward and worked on the opening of this museum. And keep in mind that this is the idea now of a national history museum. So these museums are something of a national importance. The second museum to be opened was in 1974, and it was the Museum of Fine Arts. It was housed in the Admiralty House in South Street in Valletta. And along with Father Zerapa, they had to make sure that this house was restored enough for the collections to have an adequate home to reside in. A guide, and you can see the first picture of, this, uh, of the guide here, was also prepared and distributed at the opening of the museum. It highlighted the key artifacts along with some general information on the exhibits themselves. The last museum to be opened under Mali as director was a World War Museum. 
and this plan, this museum was planned when Malia was already curator. So he received a proposal by David Stains, who wanted to open a World War II museum in the Cotonera area. So it could act as a, a mode of recovery for the area. This project was shelved, but when it was opened in 1975, most of the artifacts had already been collected beforehand, and so it was easy to open. And keep in, no in mind that in three years, three museums were opened. So 1973, 1974, and 1975. The importance of, uh, of opening up as many museums as could be. The last museum that Francis Malia as director worked on was the Folklore Museum. And this was very much in line with the vision of the Labour government. The Labour government at the time was aiming in pushing forward the idea of Maltese identity, the idea of Maltese worker, and it was important to show materials such as 18th century pottery, for example, milk, milk bottles, and other elements which form part of the traditional Maltese life. And this folklore museum was a way to link the political idea of the government and also archaeology in the sense. And a building was found in 1977 in Gozo. Now that we've looked at six key moments from Francis Malia, I've picked three themes for discussion which emerge from these key moments. The first is the development of archaeological methods and techniques in Malta between the 1950s and 1980s. Archaeology as the modern scientific discipline we know today has been developing since the early 20th century. And by the 1960s, the concept of stratigraphy and the stratigraphic method was already well established in the United Kingdom. Yet this did not mean that it was the only method available. And as we've mentioned already, the Italian split method was also popular. And so in Malta, there was no standard method of archaeological techniques. And one of the reasons for that was that there was no formal teaching of archaeology at the time. So any person in a position of power who had to study abroad had to go to either Britain or Italy, and that would depend also on the school of thought that you would follow. In most cases, you wouldn't have the choice of choosing where you would go. It was in Francis Maria's choice to go to Britain to study, even though he had links with John Evans, because it was something which the government chose for him. Malia believed in the stratigraphic method and practiced it when he had the opportunity, as we had seen. But since she was the only person who trained in this method, consistency on sites were impossible. And even the curator who succeeded him, Tangrid Guder, had been trained in the Italian method, which meant that even if Francis Malia started working on a site and then Tangred Guder would follow him, they were using different methods of excavation. Both were accepted, but that also meant that no effort could be made to improve and establish one archaeological method in Malta during 70s and 80s, even though as director he could establish his own method of working, he had every right to do so. This was not something he did, because the people who were trained were trained in different methods of excavation. So that would not make sense. Even though the stratigraphic method would eventually become the favored method in Malta, this was long after Francis Malia passed away. And I would contribute it mostly to the introduction of a degree in archaeology at the University of Malta. So you could argue that Malia was one of the key proponents and one, the very first person who was who the very first Maltese who, was, who had studied this stratigraphic method in England, but his work and emphasis on this method were lost in time until they were recovered and to a standardization period, which was attributed to the introduction of a degree. The second theme one could pick up is the foreign and local political influence on Maltese archaeology from 1958 to 1981. As we said already, Malta in the 1960s and 1970s was undergoing a transformation. They were trying to find an identity. And in this period, in this context, Malia's own appointment as curator had as its core tension between Italy and the United Kingdom. It wasn't his choice whether to study in Italy or in England, 
but it's this choice in itself would influence his entire career. And since David Trump was established here as curator and also as director, then Malia as curator and director, that would mean he established a pro-British outlook in his career. So it was important that he trained in British stratigraphic method and he remained with a pro-British outlook at least when it came to archaeological techniques and methods. And this can be best seen in the clash in the Missione Archaeological Italiano when it came to clashes between the Italian system and the British system. So you could see that there were three parties involved, the pro-British, the pro-Italian, and the Maltese. And in Malia's case, for certain, he was pushing a pro-British line because it was the method that he was taught, and this was what he believed was best for archaeology. When it came to Malia's appointment as director, as we saw, it also had an element of political tension. And although Malia, his reserved character and his wish to remain neutral, it resulted in more challenges because being neutral meant that it was not clear by the two parties whether to push or whether to back him or not. But this importance that he felt that to be neutral and to see the interest of archaeology first meant that he would also be able to push the department forward. And that's one of the key civil servants at the time. His experience was valued by Agatha Barbara. And even though they had completely different characters, they understood that they were there to work for the benefits of archaeology. And being politically neutral, it would also suggest that his appointments were all made on merit. The last theme to discuss today is the development of the curator and director. And since the creation of the museum's department in 1922, the curator of archaeology and the director of the museum's department had always been the leading figure when it came to Mota's culture heritage. The duties of the curator were various. It included the inspection, excavation of sites, the analysis of material, maintaining and creating new exhibits, publications. So it was normal for the curator to be spread thin. And although he, in this case, Malia, tried to keep control and be present at all sites, this was not possible. And this was why it was a sort of essence of anger for Malia. The energy and pace with which the museum's department operated depended on the energy of the curator himself. Since he had so many wide reaching duties, there came a degree of authority and autonomy from the director. And this meant that succeeding or failing in the archaeological section fell to the curator and the decisions he took. When it came to the director, he did not have one specific department to focus on. And that meant he did not have as much as autonomy because he had to follow the wishes of the government and the minister. The role of the director of the museum's department was more of an administrator. And so it meant that he was rarely out of the field and this in the field. And this was something that Malia missed and hoped that he could do more when he joined, when he retired. Each director had a particular goal to follow, that of Charles Zammit, was to reestablish the department after the war, and Malia's was to oversee the expansion and specialization of the department with the opening of several new museums. The character of the director played a huge factor in determining the relationship between the department and the minister. In this case, Malia and Barbara, as I said, managed to find a way to work together. To conclude, by using the biographical historical approach, and studying and understanding Francis Malia, one could pick up a par particular themes which give you indication on the period itself. So the first, the development in archaeological practice in Malta, only from the 1990s onwards did the stratigraphic method of excavation become the favorite method in Malta. Until the 1990s, the methods used depended on the creator's background and the other individual who was trained in archaeology. And formal teaching of archaeology in Malta was not available until the 1980s. The influence of politics on Maltese archaeology 
both Malia's appointment as curator and director could be traced back to political influence and tension. First, as curator between the Italians and the British, and then a more local influence when he became director. And the museum's department as a government department was susceptible to political influence, especially due to the number of changes in government and the status of Malta between the 1950s and 1980s. We'll, I'll be closing the talk there today, and I hope you found it interesting. There are other themes one could have picked on, such as the Malia's involvement in organizations, for example, or his, or his interest in publication, but I'm sure we'll get the opportunity to do so in the future, to talk about those in the future, and I'll happily answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Nico, for that. It was uh, really a fascinating expose of the work of, uh, of Francis Malia. And uh, it, it's a very interesting uh, story, uh, the narrative of the archaeology itself, the narrative of how Malta's um, way of doing things Comes to comes to the fore that uh, the political influences and the the problems involved in uh, civil service appointments and uh, this is um, a, the story of somebody who really uh, tried uh, his his very best to follow um, the uh, to follow his studies and who was clearly um, thorough systematic, uh, totally dedicated to, to what he felt was really important um, for Malta. So I think it was wonderful that we had this occasion this evening to review, as you have done, the work of uh, Francis Malia. Um, there are a few, a few questions. Uh, I think that, um, Rather a comment from me, just to sort of kick it off, perhaps. The, the work of the director, well, of the curator and then of the director, is in a small place like this, huge. It's so clearly very, very large when you're dealing with uh, just one museum, the National Museum of Archaeology, let alone when um, you start discussing uh, the development of further museums, as you pointed out, the Fine Arts Museum, the Folklore Museum, the Natural History Museum. Um, this all requires an all, a lot of um, human resources and uh, trained human resources as well. Uh, some, somebody was asking, what about um, the people who were starting. I, I know that uh, uh, Francis Malia passed away in 88 and I, I had the, the pleasure of meeting him um, before he died uh, myself, possibly in the last year of his life. Uh, there were other people working at that time. Um, who were his colleagues really? In, in, in who was he working with uh, within, within, the, within the department? When it came to the museum's department itself, the when he became curator it was first david trump as his mentor then he had the closest link with john kauke they were curators john kauke was a curator of fine arts he was a curator of archaeology there was a curator of the national history collection which was harry Vassallo, and also charles Zammit, who was the director of the museum's department so at the time it wasn't such a big department and then when Maria became curator and the department was growing, then there was the need for assistant curators to be appointed. So there was first the assistant curator of fine arts, who was Father Mario Zerafa, and then there was the assistant curator of archaeology, who was Tangred Guder. And the idea was that at the same way that Maria was trained by David Trump, in the sense they were training the next generation of curators. So when Malia became director, then Tangrid Buder could step up and become curator. 
those were the main people who were involved in the department. But then you had the other people, such as Mario Bohajar, who was involved in particular projects in the department. But when it comes to curator, that was, that was the team. One point that I wanted to make on your comment, we need to keep in mind that in this period, there wasn't the superintendents of cultural heritage, for example, there wasn't the center for restoration. So it was centralized in the museum's department and the work was all there. So exhibits, excavation analysis. So there was more pressure on the department itself. And then obviously there were other colleagues who were focusing on the teaching of archaeology and Malia himself, for example, did enter into this field later on when he tried to, with Professor Anthony Bonanno, for example, give evening courses as director and then after, even after he retired as well. So it was another point that we did not mention today, but later on in his career, he was also thinking about teaching the next generation and how important that was of teaching the next generation. Yes. Uh, in fact, um, Keith Buhajar is mentioning on the uh, chat that um, he believed that uh, um, uh, Mario Buhajar did receive his formation under, under Malia. Um, yes, in fact, the, the idea that archaeology should be um, uh, taught at the university, at university level, um, really came uh, came very much late, very much late, rather late in the day, considering the kind of ar archaeological resources that Malta, small as it is, has really. Um, the people at, like Malia would have come from architecture, uh, really, not from arch archaeology, and then uh, would have gone into studies in archaeology at a later at a later date. Um, I, I think I, I came in on the second year in, in 1988, the second year of full time courses at the university. And it always struck me that it, such courses should have been going on a long time before that. Um, even just to recognize the importance of the work in hand. And at the time, at Malia's time, there was quite a bit of excavation. Nowadays, there doesn't seem to be such a, an enthusiasm for actual excavation, except a lot of rescue excavation, which is happening <laughs> because of this um, uh, development streak that we're going through. Uh, but um, the, the philosophy now is not quite so oriented towards, towards excavation. Um, but but still, I mean, obviously, it's an important an important part of uh, archaeological archaeological training. Um, I don't know. There's another one coming up here. Uh, is it correct to say that Malia played a role with the foundation of the archaeological and classics department together with Professor Bonanno? Perhaps if Professor Bonanno is is with us. Perhaps he might like to to say something about that. Okay, I'll I'll mute myself. Um, I meant to say something uh, of a different nature, but <clears throat> give credit to Franz Malion, uh, an academic subject uh, per se. But uh, I'll, I'll answer. I'll try to answer your question first. Um, the idea of a, uh, a lectureship in archaeology uh, in the late sixties uh, developed between. I think three different personalities who represented three different departments. One, the Department of Classics, with, headed by Professor Colero, who of course was interested in, uh, in including in his department a, a lectureship in classical archaeology uh, to complement his, his department. The Department of History, headed by uh, Professor Bella, uh, not, not, not our colleague, of course, but uh, um, the, the Dominican father. Uh, and thirdly, strangely enough, the Department of Philosophy, just because uh, Father Peter Sergio Anglot 
and was a very influential person and had visions uh, of especially of the, the teaching the Mediterranean you know, culture. And I had the impression that there was a little bit of, uh, I would say, competition uh, or trying to uh, protect the, each one their own turf uh, in promoting this lectureship. Eventually, uh, the call for applications was made on the Department of Classics. At the time, classics, not archaeology. <clears throat> that was in 71. As a matter of fact, something that most people do not know is that I did uh, take part in the uh, competition uh, for assistant curator together with Tankard Guder at that time. Uh, however, I, although I did qualify to, to get the post, uh, at the same time, there was the call for applications for <clears throat> the lectureship, and I decided to stay away from the background that has been so well illustrated by Nico, that is the political setup, and therefore I chose the university. <laughs> and I never looked back on my decision. So, uh, but how, uh, however, uh, I must say that uh, I, I did invite uh, Franz Malia before setting up the BA course in 1987, as you correctly uh, mentioned. Uh, I collect, I, I uh, invited Franz Malia to help me in uh, evening courses. Keep in mind that between 1979 and 1986, the Faculty of Arts had been suppressed. Therefore, there was no way in that over that 10 years or so uh, of developing uh, a, a discipline in archaeology. And the opportunity came up uh, when Franz Malia had already retired, that is in, 80, in 87, with the change of government and the change in, in the policy of the university. If, you, if, you, if I may, uh, I would like to give credit to Franz Malia for another topic, another theme, uh, for which I think he was the first one to propound it in Malta, and uh, it has developed since then. That is the identification uh, of vine trenches. Uh, I think the, the only way he expressed himself, apparently from the absence of such uh, information about this theme uh, in, his, in his archive, uh, and Nico, I think, has excluded any uh, encounter with this theme. Uh, he must have shared personally with me that his, uh, this, uh, his, his discovery uh, of these vine trenches that were characteristic that he encountered also in his excavations, especially at Likli. Uh, he mentioned a word to me which stuck to my mind as lanu uh, for one and lani plural. Uh, however, uh, in an article, um, when I came to write an article for a local band club, Freedom Band Club, uh, I went to, went to check this term in the in Aquilina's uh, vocabulary dictionary, and uh, I found that he had a reference to a word called lan and the plural laniid, uh, which uh, had two meanings. The second one was precisely trenches cut in the rock in order to provide further uh, dampness, uh, further uh, sources of uh, uh, water to, to trees. And that's the principle practically of the, the vine trenches. And since then, of course, vine trenches have been turning up uh, all over Malta, you know, with, with the, these monitoring uh, that, that take place with development. But uh, I think I owe it to Franz Malia to mention this uh, idea for its originality. He was the first one uh, I believe, I, I stand corrected, to actually expound and uh, um, perhaps m make an effort for it to actually be investigated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, First Bonanda, for that. I see that um, Mark Brinkart has his hand raised. Uh, uh, perhaps you'd like to say something. I, I just like to say something. I mean, I have a particular interest here because my wife is is Frances Maria's uh, daughter. But um, um, I, I would just say that in, in those days, 
the, 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 and I was, but I, I was a director of the civil service, but also a joint academic as a professor for many years. And in those days, there were the, the, the civil service was very much like a sort of tertiary education sector. It was like another um, another pathway, if you like. So there was a, the university system in, in the 40s and 50s, which was gaining ground. Um, the civil service to which Francis Valia belonged to, and to which several of his brothers belonged to as well. His other brothers also became directors in different departments. This was like an alternative tertiary education pathway, if you like, where people went up the ranks, they, they got their qualifications and progressed or didn't progress. Um, and it was another career pathway which, which people took. And sometimes they collaborated with the university and sometimes um, they were on their own parallel routes. And I'm happy to say that here we find the first attempts at bridging the two pathways. Because uh, uh, Professor Antti Bonanno here mentioned Professor Monsignor Coleiro, who I remember and, and, and keep with very high regard. That was with my father. And we all know that he was a great classicist and he was seeing his world crumbling beneath him. Uh, we have to be very blunt about this. The world, the classics was crumbling in those days for various reasons. Um, but th there was this, th this other part. It's, people don't realize today that the civil service was in its way very much uh, a career pathway whereby people would go into uh, as an alternative to a university education. They were equal, equivalent, if not superior, if you like. Absolutely. I'm sure that's a very, very good point. I think the civil service um, definitely did have that function uh, in, in the past. Perhaps um, there isn't so much of a need for it uh, a need for it now, since the university has been so further developed um, than it was before. Um, somebody mentions Dr. Luttrell, uh, who I don't think I've, I ever met myself. Um, that, uh, the comment is that he was involved in excavations in uh, medieval archaeology. Perhaps somebody who knows uh, Dr. Luttrell well could sort of place him in time vis-a-vis -vis Francis Malia. If I may intervene again, yes. uh, because I had direct relations with uh, Anthony Latrell and we actually joined forces in a proper excavation, by the way, a proper stratigraphic excavation, which took place in 1977. And that took place in a medieval church uh, of Hal Milleri. Uh, but of course, the, the crucial uh, archeologist personality in archeology span at that time, was another person, a certain Tom Blagg, who unfortunately died at a very young age, <clears throat> has left us some a few years ago. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> it is uh, uh, in that excavation, uh, we actually use the stratigraphic method as of course the uh, records that have been published in a special publication, uh, I think 1980, was published 80 or 81 um, <clears throat> uh, shows. So uh, even when, when in those dark ages in that dark period, uh, an excavation took place with the full uh, support and, and cooperation of Francis Malia, who was director uh, of the museum's department at that time. In fact, uh, in, in the book or in some place, other places, I, uh, I remember there is a photograph uh, showing uh, Franz Malia uh, leading the minister at that time, Mr. Minister Barbara, uh, on site, leading her uh, and showing her the site. Mm. Yes, at, at Halmiliri, you mean? Yes, and, but uh, yes, Anthony, Anthony Latter, of course, was the promoter of that excavation. He mm. was not an archaeologist, but he had a direct interest in archaeology. He had been uh, assistant director of the British School at Rome at the time of uh, uh, Ward Perkins, John Ward Perkins, and he had more at heart, really. And in fact, eventually he joined the uh, le lectures, uh, who was a lecturer, full time lecturer at the university. And, and, and wrote the book, as far as I know. Oh, several books, uh, more oh, than well, the well, Middle Ages, I mean. because 1975, he wrote a book about the Halmiliri area. Uh, before the excavation, and of course, uh, uh, he was one of the team uh, which pub which published the uh, second volume about the excavations of Hal Melir. Mm. Well, certainly, uh, clearly, it was necessary um, and 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 
uh, it was a good way of introducing um, new ideas and, and, and ideas coming from outside um, uh, because it's such a, jo a huge job for one or two people to, uh, to, to do. Uh, and, but it is interesting, as Nico has pointed out, to see how, uh, firstly, the, the, the different uh, methodological uh, approaches of the Italians versus the, the, the British, how it all sort of played in really um, at, at, at that time. It must have been quite, uh, quite, quite difficult to navigate, I would imagine, um, uh, at that time. Um, I, I'm not seeing any more questions, uh, just unless anybody else, perhaps from the family, would like to uh, give us a final comment um, about, about uh, Francis Malia. I don't know whether anybody wants to say a word before we, before we go. But um, anyway, it's been, it's been a, a very instructive evening. For, for me, I've, I've been really interested. I'm sure everybody else was. We had a lovely, good number of people with us this evening, and uh, uh, somebody saying, "Oh, good! I never met my my nanu, so this lecture was amazing to listen to. Thank you for taking the time to put it together." And uh, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, but well done to Nico for doing the work, and uh, I'm de delighted that uh, some members of the family have had the opportunity to learn about uh, about their. Uh, about their nanu or their, or their father. Um, well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, as I said, this is the last of, uh, of the series for this, for this year, for this season. Um, we look forward to seeing you all again in October. Uh, I do urge you all to become members of the Archaeological Society Malta through our website at www.archsoc.org.mt. Uh, in that way, you will be supporting the Society in its lecture program, uh, its peer-reviewed journal, which is now up and running successfully on the website, and also in its advocacy work in support of all things archaeological in Malta, um, uh, uh, a responsibility that we take very seriously as a society. Um, sincere thanks. Uh, from the Society and from the Department of Classics and Archaeology uh, to Nico Muscat for his most illuminating talk tonight. Uh, he has reminded us that it is so very important that we remember those who come before us um, and uh, lay the path down for us coming later on. The ASM looks forward to seeing you all again in October Follow us on Facebook and on our website. Thank you so much to the members of the family who are here this evening um, and uh, good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>